Today we introduce the foundation of our final module, module 4, that studies the limits of computation. So we will learn today about acceptance tests, emptiness tests, and equality tests. Um, before that, let's think about why do we need to study Turing machines. And the, the basic idea that I want you to remember is, first and foremost, recall the Church-Turing thesis. And recall that Turing machines, they represent programs and computers. So what we want to study in the last module is understand what can be done and what cannot be done by computers. Really to understand the limits. So we will study mathematically what are these limits. And we're going to prove interesting properties about Turing machines and therefore about programs. So one very important notion that we need to understand is Turing recognizability. And Turing recognizability is just to say that there is a Turing machine that recognizes a certain language. As we saw before, when you have a regular language, you have a DFA that accepts that um, language. So we say that that DFA recognizes a certain language. Similarly, if we have a context-free language, we have a PDA that recognizes that language. So the language of the PDA is the same as the language we're thinking about. So when we say that a language is Turing recognizable, we just mean that there is some program that recognizes it, right? Because the Turing machine is effectively a program. And we are, just to re rehash what we've been saying right from the beginning of module two, we are still just interested in decision problems, that is to say, programs that just return yes or no. So we have some formula, logical expression, that we want to represent. We want to be able to know whether we can implement such formula with a program such that that program says yes, then the formula says yes, and vice versa. So if and only if, right? Um, so those, nothing new here. Um, so Turing rec recognizability is the is definition 3.5 of the book that we've been following so far. And the notation is, as usual, the language of the machine. So what is decidability? Decidability is another concept that we'll see over and over. So far, we've seen recognizability. That's just to say that the language has some Turing machine that recognizes that language. The decidability is just a Turing machine that always replies yes or no for all possible inputs. To put it in, in simpler terms, if you know, if you think about a program, is a program that you prove that it terminates for all inputs. So imagine, so here because in a way, we are just defining interested in programs that say yes or no. So think of this as programs, Boolean programs, right? A program that returns true or false. But as you know, you can write a, a program that loops. If the program loops, that would be the equivalent of a Turing machine looping forever, right? And as we've learned, Turing machines can do three things. They could either halt and accept an input. They could either halt and reject an input, or they could be looping forever. And in which case, they would also reject the input. That counts as the language, the word not being accepted by that Turing machine. So a decidable Turing machine is just that one that terminates for all inputs. So it either rejects or accepts the input. So that is definition 3.6 from the book. A decidable language is just a language that has some Turing machine that recognizes it, and that Turing machine is decidable. Okay, very, very simple definition. So how do we know that a Turing machine is decidable or not? Well, we need to prove it. That's essentially what we're going to do in the next following lesson. So just to recap, a Turing machine is decidable if it rejects or accepts any input, all inputs, right? 
If you find a single input where the Turing machine loops, then that Turing machine is not, is not decidable. And we say that a language is decidable if there is at least one Turing machine that recognizes it, and that Turing machine is decidable. We even say that the Turing machine is a decider. So again, to recap, decidable algorithms are just Turing algorithms that we can prove that they always terminate. They can be implemented in any language. Whenever you hear about a decidable algorithm, that's what it is. So you may also hear some uh, people say, referring to programs that always terminate as total, programs that are total. And this comes from mat mathematics. And a total function is one that is defined for all inputs. So if you can show that if you've defined your function in returning a value for every input, that function is total. So if you have an endless loop, that means that the simplest case where you have f of x equals and you call f of x, the return there is no return value, right? So you can think of that as a function that has no return value, therefore not total, partial function. You could also just simply have the function not being the so as we've learned, Coq is actually the programming language. When you do a definition, the definitions have to be total, right? So you have no way of writing functions. So if you write any function in Coq, that function has to be total. You have to prove that it terminates. So by definition, any function that you write in Coq that is a Boolean would be a decidable algorithm. So a very easy way to prove that an algorithm terminates is just write it in cock. Then it is decidable. So let's think about, let me give you an example of an algorithm and to make it a bit more concrete. So this algorithm that I'm highlighting in blue represents the implementation of the acceptance algorithm. Right? So that is to say, if you have a DFA and you have a sequence of a word, right? So inputs corresponds to word. So if a word is a string in Python, you know that you can iterate over all characters. Right? So a very easy implementation of accepting, right? of knowing whether or not a DFA accepts a given input is you define a variable as t that is initialized with the start state. And then what you do is you iterate over each letter of your word. And what do you do? You take the transition function of that DFA and you pass it the current state, right? Which starts as in the state. And then the current letter. So you start from the first letter and then what does that return? If this is the transition function that would return the following state, right? So if you imagine, if you are a visual person, um, this would be one node, the i would be the edge. The return value of this function would be the, where the edge points to. So because, as you know, DFAs, the transition function always returns the following state. If you call it, you just get the following state. If you reach, so if at the end of the last character, you've reached an accepted state, that means your DFA has accepted the input, right? So this is a correct implementation of um, accepting an input, right, by a DFA. So if you have a DFA and if you have a string that represents its word, this function will return yes or no if and only if the DFA accepts the input, right? So I can make an argument that the output is always true. So it, it kind of um, has an equivalent meaning of what would a DFA represent. So then this, this algorithm is implementing, right? It's implementing some um, property, which is recognizing a DFA recognizing a word. So in a way, this 
the language of a given DFA, right, would be Turing recognizable. Why? Because there is an algorithm that recognizes it, right? which accepts uh, all the inputs if and only if the DFA accepts the input. So now, is this a decidable algorithm? So we know that this returns a Boolean, right? Because this expression is a Boolean. So therefore, this always returns yes or no, right? So is this function total? That is to say, is this, does this function terminate for all inputs? Okay, let's, let's think. How do we prove this? This is just an informal proof. So DFA, we have, what are our inputs? We have a DFA and we have a string, a list of characters. So what are we doing? If the list is finite, that means that this loop is finite. This instruction from here, you always execute this. Right? And this loop is bounded by the number of elements of the word, which means that after n iterations, where n is the length of the word, you will proceed to the final return value, and then you will return, which means after n plus 2 instructions, where n is the length of the word, you will execute this whole function, right? So therefore, this function always terminates for all inputs, right? So in the smallest case, your input has length 0, you would execute this, you would not run this loop and you would just return the, the loop the for loop uh, is bounded therefore terminates always and these two instructions terminate obviously so this whole thing terminates 